Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Naya Hyde, and I'm the Marketing Assistant for K-12 Education Products here at Brooks Publishing. To start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Next slide, please. You'll be muted for the webinar, but if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box. We'll take these questions after the presentation during the Q&A portion of the webinar. For the presentation, you might want to minimize the GoToWebinar bar on your monitor so you can see more on your screen. You can do that by clicking the orange button with the arrow in the top corner of the control bar. If you need to enlarge the bar again to ask a question or access the handout, you can click the orange button again. If you experience any audio issues at any point, you can switch the phone by clicking in the audio section of the webinar panel and using the dial-in information provided. Also, we are recording this webinar, so everyone who registered for the event will receive a link to the recording in a follow-up email tomorrow. Next slide. During today's presentation, Joanne Parody and Fred Genesee will reference content from their new book, Dual Language Development and Disorders, a Handbook, Handbook on Bilingualism and Second Language Learning, the third edition. Updated with the latest research and recommended practices, this book gives a broad audience of future professionals the clear and comprehensive information they need to promote positive outcomes for young dual language learners and make informed decisions about assessment and intervention when a disorder is present. To learn more about the book, you can visit the URL shown on your screen. Next slide. I'm happy to announce that Brooks will be giving away three copies of this new book, Dual Language Development and Disorders, a Handbook on Bilingualism and Second Language Learning, their third edition. Winners will be randomly selected from today's live attendees and notified by email after the webinar. To increase your chances, be sure to submit your questions in the questions pane throughout the presentation. Next slide. Also, we did want to mention at the end of the webinar, you will be prompted to complete a short survey. We would love to know what you thought of today's webinar. And anyone who completes this survey will also be entered to win a free book. Next slide. Everyone watching this webinar will be able to download a certificate of attendance. For those of you watching live, you can download your certificate from the handout pane located in your GoToWebinar control panel. Live attendees will also be emailed their certificate in the next 24 hours. And for those of you who are watching this webinar as a recording, stay tuned to the end of today's webinar to learn how you can access your certificate as well. Without further delay, I'm happy to introduce today's speaker. speakers. Dr. Parody is a professor in the Department of Linguistics and adjunct professor in Communication Sciences and Disorders at the University of Alberta. Her research is concerned with bilingualism and children with typical development and in children with developmental disorders. In particular, children learning English as a second language from immigrant and refugee families. Dr. Genesee is a professor emeritus in the psychology department at McGill University. The goal of his research and professional interest is to discover children's capacity for acquiring language by examining language development in second language learners and simultaneous bilinguals under diverse circumstances. Thank you so much for joining us today, Fred and Joanne. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm so excited so many of you have come here to listen to us talk about the book. Um, so Fred and I are gonna be going a bit back and forth in um, how we talk about uh, the book. And we're gonna start by giving you a little overview of what's um, uh, about what's in the uh, new edition. And then we're gonna talk a bit about more about the, the content. So I'm first up. And I thought the first question that might be interesting to talk about is why we actually wrote a third edition in the first place. Um, so some of you may or may not know our first edition was in 2004, which seems like a really, really long time ago. I mean, this was when people only had flip phones, you know, really long time ago. And then we're in 2011 was uh, second edition. And 10 years later, we're here at the uh, third edition. So um, if you look at the slide on the, this side, you'll see this upside down pyramid and one of the main reasons why we really wanted to write a third edition is because of the absolutely exponential growth 
growth in research on these topics on dual language development in typical learners, on dual language development in learners with language and communication disorders and reading difficulties, and um, a lot of uh, research looking to see how clinical practice and educational practices can be better shaped to suit the needs of these children. So when we first wrote the book in 2004, um, we were having to extrapolate from a very thin research base to try our best to answer the many questions that we get from um, educators, practitioners, and professors who, who teach them. And then there was more research for the 2011. We felt, yeah, now we can really answer these questions with a more solid research base. Well, in 2021, um, uh, we feel even more confident that uh, the research base that we're drawing upon to make our recommendations and synthesizing the research is much, much more robust. And I think personally what's been gratifying for me is the knowledge that even back in 2004, many of the recommendations and things that we, we, we brought forward that was based on this very slim base, many of them are still, we would stand by them today. So the, it's like the, the research has grown to, to fit that that you know, those early those early recommendations and thoughts on the thin research base. So we, I think we we feel good about that. But that being said, we've had to refine many of our recommendations and how we discuss things and some of our claims um, as well. So new book. I'm going to do something. It's a little cheesy, but here we go. So here's the uh, 2011 volume, and here is the one for um, the 2021. And you can see, if you look, hopefully I'm holding this up to my camera right, that it's really, really thicker. There is 150 more pages in the new book because there's just that much more information that we want to, to give to our readers. Um, one of the things we have in the new edition is a whole new chapter on heritage language development. So this is development of a minority language that is um, typically uh, immigrant language, language of children who are first or second generation immigrants uh, because of the importance, um, the growing importance of uh, research on heritage language development and how it um, can help in second language development and how important it is for children to keep learning their heritage language. So we have a chapter on that. Um, Every chapter in the new book has been um, updated, even the intro chapter where we have our, our profiles of our um, sort of fictional children that we refer to throughout the book. We've made some changes even to uh, that chapter. So no chapter is unchanged. Um, <clears throat> I would say that the, the chapters that have received the most substantial revisions have been chapter two, the uh, language culture connection chapter. This one has been greatly expanded in terms of its scope and the um, breadth and depth of research cited. Um, and I'd say that our last two chapters, Fred and I spent a long time building these chapters and they are very much expanded and I think um, improved immensely. This is our chapters on language and communication disorders in bilingual children. So in this chapter, we talk about what is, um, you know, bilingualism look like? How does it unfold in kids with language and communication disorders like developmental language disorder, autism spectrum disorder, Down syndrome? And we also talk about issues in assessment, strategies for assessment, and and an expanded uh, section on intervention. And then in the reading disorders and difficulties in bilingual students, this is, um, and Fred's gonna be talking more about this one uh, later, this has more information about how kids learn how to read, how second language, uh, how kids learn in their second language, much more um, depth and breadth about reading disorders and difficulties and lots and lots of recommendations for practitioners. So I feel really excited about these chapters. I'm excited about the whole book, but I'm excited about um, these chapters in particular. So now I'm going to turn it over to Fred. In the new book, uh, this really was a labor of love. As Joanne pointed out, we felt that the second edition was really a good extension of the first, but the third one was essential in order to really uh, bring people up to date. Now, in addition to the changes that Joanne mentioned, there are other changes we made to the volume in an attempt to, to make it more user-friendly, to highlight what we think are some of the most important pieces of information we're uh, sharing with you, and also to engage readers more. 
So at the beginning of each chapter, there's a list of learning objectives. So these are uh, what we think are the main points to be taken away from the chapter as you uh, set about to read it. There are also expanded voices from the field. If you've read the other uh, editions, you remember these are uh, inserts in the book that are from uh, people in the field who are giving firsthand accounts of issues that we're discussing in each of the chapters. We've also included more tables, figures, and boxes in each of the chapters, uh, partly because we felt that increasingly people are used to uh, accessing information on the internet. And in that format, there's a lot of graphic information as well as textual information. So we decided that more graphic information would serve to highlight important uh, things that we're saying in each chapter, but also make it more user-friendly for readers. Uh, there are also changes at the end of each chapter. We have summaries of each chapter. Uh, in section one, it's summaries. In section two, there are key points and implications. And then in section three, it's recommendations for policy and practice. And the reason why there, there are these differences in these sections is that these sections do different things. And I don't have time to get into that, but you'll see that it makes sense that we have different including sections for each uh, section uh, chapter. Next slide, Joanne. Uh, there's also some additions to the, um, the book and, uh, and it's an information that you can get online. In particular, there's a downloadable parent questionnaire for speech and language uh, pathology specialists. And you can access on this on the Brooks website and print it and use it. You, I think you'll find this extremely useful. It's been widely used already around the world. Uh, there's also some online uh, material for course instructors. So we've included discussion questions for each chapter, class activities, and some final student projects. Of course, people are using this for instructional purposes. will uh, come up with their own discussion questions and so on, but we thought that these would give you a, a head start on doing that. Next slide, please. So um, in the remaining section of our uh, brief webinar this afternoon, we want to highlight certain features of the book. We obviously can't go through every chapter, it would take too long. Um, and these are the, uh, the aspects or the, um, uh, the domains of the book that we're going to highlight in the remaining minutes that we have with you. Um, Joanne will start off by talking about insights about bilingualism in children with typical development. You'll notice that throughout the book, Everything that we say about children who have language or reading difficulties or disorders is really grounded in an understanding of typical development in these domains. You can't understand atypical development without understanding typical development. And there's been an enormous explosion of research on typical development, both in language and in reading in monolingual children, but also bilingual children. So Joanne will give you a taste of some of that. I'll then follow up with a discussion of the benefits of bilingualism, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more when we get to there. I'll then pass it back to Joanne, who will talk about what research has to say about children with language and communication disorders and bilingualism. So we've, we've gained an enormous set of insights about this domain because there's so much more research in, and also professional knowledge during the intervening years. Finally, I'll talk about uh, what we now know about children uh, reading, both typical reading development, but also the reading development in children who are struggling learning to read. And I'm going to do this in the context of both typical monolingual children, but also in the context, obviously, of dual language learners or bilingual children who may be learning through a second language. Okay, back to Joanne. Thanks, Fred. So um, it's this was really hard to pick highlights because I'm so enthusiastic about uh, so much of this and we have a chapter on bilingual first language acquisition early bilinguals we have a chapter on second language learners we have a chapter on code mixing we have a chapter on heritage language acquisition uh, so it's hard to pick okay what, what are the highlights here so um, but I, you know I managed to do something um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is uh, the reason why I chose it is because this is a question that is asked a lot and is heavily debated and this is whether very early bilinguals and I'm talking here about simultaneous bilinguals so those who learn their two languages um, maybe from birth in the first couple of years uh, of life um, do they keep pace with their monolingual peers in their language development or is 
um, this early bilingualism um, a source of delay that we might see in children. And uh, in the chapter on simultaneous bilinguals, we have uh, quite, a, quite a section on this. And um, essentially, I've got boiled some, something down to a couple of key points here, that the research really points to the fact that simultaneous bilinguals can keep pace. Most of them can keep pace and do keep pace with monolinguals in at least their dominant language. They don't always do it in both of their languages, but in their dominant language, they're often within the range of normal expectations. They are typically not at the top end of that range at this early stage, because of course they're learning you know, two languages at the, in this same amount of time that monolinguals only have to do one, but they do they do pretty well at keeping pace in the dominant language. Um, and uh, one of the ways in which this is, is shown is how many words they learn. So bilingual children are not slower to learn words than monolingual children. However, their uh, dis vocabulary learning, especially in the early stages, is distributed across two languages. So what I've got here on the um, I guess it's it's my my right side. I don't know. It might be your left side or you know stage right. Okay, stage right here. I've got some um, graphs from a study by Erica Hoff looking at uh, children's vocabulary. These children are Spanish English bilinguals, and they're compared to English monolinguals. And um, just very quickly, I won't go in the details, but if you separate each individual language, the children look like they have fewer words in English and Spanish than the monolinguals. But if you add English and Spanish together and you subtract out translation equivalents, we see quite a smooth line here for the two groups. And that is one piece of evidence, we have many more, to, um, to support our, um, our conclusion that uh, bilingual children are not, in fact, highly delayed, these early bilinguals, when they're learning um, two languages. Now, a related question, which is another one we get a lot, um, pertains to English second language learners or ELLs, ELs, there's so many different words in English as an additional language learners. And this is about catching up to monolinguals. Um, I get so many questions at, um, it, professional development workshops or, you know, over email or from students about, you know, when do these second language learners, these ELLs, catch up to their monolingual peers? And we tackle this question, um, uh, you know, in depth in um, our chapter six. And um, I won't go into the details of this uh, particular chart here. It is in the book. Um, but in, in a nutshell, we find that the, this question of catching up um, needs more nuance. There is no simple answer to this question. Um, and one of the big reasons why there's no simple answer to this question is that ELLs catch up for different linguistic and lit liter literacy subdomains at different times in their development. Um, so some, some things like say um, skills with storytelling and narrative macrostructure catch up very quickly, maybe in a couple of years they're in, uh, most kids in the normal range of performance, but verb morphology lags behind for quite a few years. So there's no one simple answer um, to the catching up um, uh, question. And also we, we have urged readers in this chapter to rethink the concept of catching up because basically you're trying to force dual language learners into a monolingual mold that the only thing you're concerned about is whether they, when do they look identical to monolinguals? Well, they actually will never look identical to monolinguals um, in, in the broadest sense here. They, they have another language, their learning trajectories are shaped by dual language experiences. So to some extent that we have to think about catching up in, in a different way to have a, a, a healthier um, attitude and understanding of these children's um, language development, even in their second language. Another thing that we have spent a lot more time on in this version of the book because, again, research has hugely focused on this over the last 10 years, is um, trying to figure out what are the factors that contribute to whether children acquire their languages uh, faster than others. Because some individuals, uh, many of you would have experienced this if you work directly with L2 children, some seem to just um, uh, soak it up like a sponge and learn English very quickly and others uh, take a longer time and then there's all the ones in the middle. So uh, researchers have been very busy trying to figure out how to predict uh, faster or slower English language acquisition, um, often with, with a view to um, understanding uh, how to identify children who are most at risk and might need uh, more support than say other children. 
So in um, the chapter six and also in chapter seven, we go through a lot of these different factors here. So we talk about child internal factors, what the child brings to the language learning process. Um, and we talk about it uh, mainly in terms of ELLs who speak a minority language, a heritage language and learning English in school. But many of them also um, explain language learning in um, children who are elective bilinguals who say learn a second language through their education like in an immersion program. So we've got child internal factors like age, um, like uh, what the typology of their first language is and how that can transfer or not transfer to their L2, um, their cognitive abilities, memory and analytical reasoning, uh, motivation, personality, although that has limited relevance to the minority L1 learners. Child external factors have been widely explored now. Um, it's way beyond just length of exposure to the L2 and saying, oh, well, if a child has two years of schooling, they're going to be better than a child with four years of schooling. We've gone far beyond that in the field. We're looking at the um, use of language at home and with peers, with parents versus siblings, because that makes a difference. Um, how rich the um, L2 environment is outside of school with extracurriculars, with book reading, and with multi, um, multimodal media engagement, because um, we used to, a long time ago in our questionnaires, asking parents, does, does your child, how much TV does your child watch and how many books, physical books, does your child read? Well, many children nowadays are engaging in, in um, engaging in media in very different ways. They're reading fewer hardcover books and they're not just clicking on that television, but they are still engaging in all kinds of um, rich and let's say not so rich um, media. So we're trying to, research is trying to figure out what helps their L2 development and what might you know not help their L2 development in that regard. Um, and of course, we're looking at things like socioeconomic status and parent education as a driver of slow versus fast development. Something that's really new on the scene is and is uh, something that we've labeled in the book as internal external. And what this refers to is socio emotional well being or mental health. Um, and uh, this this refers to um, whether the child has um, mental health issues or well being issues that can um, interfere with their cognitive processing um, and cause behavior problems and um, mental processing problems that uh, in turn interfere with their L2 learning. And this is a new area that people are looking at, especially with respect to children who are from refugee backgrounds who've experienced all kinds of hardships um, before coming to the host country. And finally, um, in the uh, chapter on heritage language uh, learning, we describe the process of heritage language learning. We describe things like individual difference factors that, that promote it. Um, but we also in this chapter um, have um, a dose of, uh, of recommendations, a strong dose of recommendations. So we offer some strategies for parents to um, try to get their kids to keep the, the heritage language, um, ways in which they can use the language at home that uh, will help their kids build it and maintain it even after they're immersed in, in English at school. Um, and then we also have strategies for educators of what to, what to do in the classroom to support dual language learners to make them feel more welcome, uh, to make the, their language, their, their heritage language more valued, to take a, a posture where the heritage language is a resource um, for second language learning um, and uh, things like that. All right, so um, I think it's time to turn it over to Fred. This book from the very beginning is that we wanted to explore this long-standing uh, fear, I might say, the notion that bilingualism and bilingual education come at a cost, both in terms of linguistic development, in terms of academic development, or in terms of social emotional development. And this was this was the primary view uh, uh, at the time that we began to write this book. So in this section, uh, what I want to do is identify what research has said are, are, are the benefits of bilingualism and bilingual education. And the overall story, and this is a, a message that really pervades the whole book. And it, I have to say that it's a, a message that pervades our thinking about the research. 
Uh, and so you're not going to see it in a specific place in the book. You're going to see it discussed at, uh, in every chapter, in fact, where we take on this issue of bilingualism as a deficit versus bilingualism as a benefit. So obviously, and I won't discuss all of these. I have two slides on this, and I, I have enough time to discuss all of them. But obviously, the most significant and obvious benefit to being bilingual is the ability to communicate with people with more people than you could if you were monolingual. Now, this is particularly important uh, for children, immigrant children, uh, children who are live in communities where other languages are spoken because they're in contact with people who may speak only another language. So being bilingual allows them to communicate with family, grandparents, friends, shopkeepers, and so on in a way they couldn't if they were uh, monolingual. But the same is true for children, majority language children who are raised bilingually or are educated bilingually, it allows them to communicate with other people uh, in their community and possibly in their family. Um, and in this age of uh, access to information on the internet, it also means that people have access to a greater variety of information because they can access information in different languages. And while English tends to continue to be the dominant language of information transfer, uh, taken together, other languages also offer a huge array of information that's available if you know those languages. I also wanted to point out, following up on a point that Joanne made, is that there's growing uh, interest in the social, emotional, and personal development of children who are raised bilingually or educated bilingually. And this is particularly true in the case of minoritized children, because often, not always, but often these children um, are challenged in the community and challenged uh, in school because their, uh, their other language or other culture is not valued to the same extent as the dominant language. And very interestingly, the, interest, the research is showing quite consistently that uh, at least minoritized children who are raised bilingually, and certainly if they're educated bilingually, have an enhanced sense of well-being. And this shows up in their, uh, their they stay at school longer, they're more likely to have uh, aspirations for continuing in schooling after high school, and in fact, in some cases, they actually outperform their minoritized peers who were in monolingual programs. So this is really, really an important aspect of bilingualism that is gaining more and more attention. Next slide, please, Joanne. Also, on a very practical level, <laughs> there's research that shows that children who are bilingual, especially, again, those who are educated bilingually, and improved and enhanced job prospects. And this makes sense because in the in a globalized economy, uh, English is certainly uh, a dog in many respects. But other languages give you an edge. So if you speak, oh, if you spoke only one language, English might be the language you would choose in the international job market. But the fact of the matter is if you spoke only English, you would be competing and at a disadvantage with many people who speak English in other languages. So there's uh, evidence that shows even that if you're bilingual, but especially if you're biliterate, you have enhanced remunerative advantages in the job market. You get paid more, you're more likely to uh, be advanced in jobs because business people are looking for uh, both multilingual but multicultural people. Now also I'm going to end off with, with the research that I'm sure many of you are aware of is the possibility that there are cognitive advantages associated with bilingualism. And in particular, there's evidence that uh, people who have advanced levels of functional bilingualism demonstrate enhanced abilities in the executive function domains. I can't get into exactly what this is, but, but a lot of you have heard of this. So, and this is true. What I want to say is that this is also controversial because re some research shows this effect, some research doesn't show this effect. And I think that probably the reason why the uh, the evidence is not consistent is because the circumstances under which bilinguals become bilingual and the context in which they become bilingual is radically different from one person to another. So uh, the, the, you might expect that the effects of that on cognitive development is going to be varied. I also want to sort of end this with a, a kind of uh, editorial comment, and that is that I think Joanne would agree with me. She can say otherwise if she doesn't that uh, when it comes to raising children bilingually or educating them bilingually, the primary concerns and the primary focus of attention, in, my, in our opinion, is should, be, should be the enhanced interpersonal communication that this provides, 
the enhanced sense of well-being and the enhanced uh, opportunities that this provides children in their lives once they leave school and leave their families. And that the cognitive benefits, while they're very important, um, in our opinion, shouldn't be the primary reasons for making these decisions. But I also want to end up by showing that none of, the, even though the research on cognitive advantages is controversial, none of this research shows that bilinguals are at a disadvantage. And this is a, a very different story than we were getting years ago when a lot of people are arguing that there were cognitive disadvantages to being bilingual. Now, I also want to just end by saying that these, these benefits do not come automatically. A little bit of bilingualism is not necessarily going to buy you these advantages. You really, you know, the evidence shows that most of these benefits are most evident in people who are highly proficient in their bilingualism and to a great extent use their bilingual skills quite continuously. Okay, next slide, please. And I think it's back to Joanne. Yes, thanks, Fred. And uh, yeah, for the record, uh, totally agree with everything that um, we, we are totally on the same page when it comes to what the primary purpose should be of, of raising children bilingually, definitely. So I'm having a little bit of a look at the time here. So I'm going to go a little quicker in this, this section. So I wanted to give some highlights of the chapter on dual language development and in children with language and communication disorders and that, that interface there. So um, one of the things that we have in, in terms of how we've organized the chapter is that we have issues in assessment with dual language learners, and then we have strategies separately. And I'm not going to go over all these issues here. Um, but the main thing is, it, you know, people have often asked me, well, can't you do issue strategy to solve it? Issue strategy to solve it. Well, you can't really do that because there's no one to one relationship between strategies that would improve assessment and the issues that arise in um, assessment with dual language learners. So um, there might be one issue that two strategies are needed to solve, and there might be uh, a strategy that's um, mapped on to more than one issue. So that's why we've organized it this way. Um, what it all boils down to is that the issues in assessment with dual language learners, um, they all boil down to either these children being over-identified as having language disorder or in other circumstances under-identified because a sort of a deficit mentality of bilingualism might lead people to think that poor, poor language learning skills are just normal for bilinguals. So we go through a whole bunch of different kinds of, of issues and then in the um, the next section of the chapter we talk about some evidence-based these are all evidence-based strategies they aren't kindly recommendations or maybe you should do this because it sounds good um, everything has evidence behind it and we have strategies about um, gathering um, adequate child background information uh, because dual language children this is uh, far more complex and this is where the um, downloadable questionnaires can be a big help we have an evidence-based um, uh, suggestions for what measures you should use in assessment and what procedures you should use and then some suggestions again evidence-based for test interpretation and some alternatives uh, to test interpretation so we are hoping this is this is far more fulsome in, than in the 2011 book and we really really hope it will be uh, of use to um, individuals practitioners who are assessing the language development of dual language learners and also in this chapter, but this is throughout the book as well, uh, you know, a lot of stuff is not just in one chapter in a silo, um, uh, you know, but here we go through it in a lot of, of detail. And this is the importance of supporting bilingualism in children who actually are diagnosed with language and communication disorders. It's often questioned, well, the child has difficulty learning language.
supporting the Heritage L1 or Minority L1 um, it actually benefits uh, the child and family well-being, even if for children who have language and communication disorders. In fact, even, even much more so um, because children with language and communication disorders, depending on the severity, are often um, their parents are long-term uh, caregivers and a very integral part of that child's social network. So ease of communication between parent and child is actually uh, vital. Um, so we also, um, there's no reason to believe that the benefits of bilingualism that uh, Fred talked about, that children with language and communication disorders would not also receive um, those benefits. I know anecdotally many situations where children with intellectual disabilities or other quite severe disorders have um, have jobs in the workplace where they serve clientele's clientele in two languages. So bilingualism is a strength um, that children with um, these uh, development, neurodevelopmental syndromes can actually achieve. Um, we also, there's evidence that the interdependence of the two languages supports the two language and there's no reason to see that that wouldn't happen in children with language and communication disorders. Um, and finally, in this uh, part of the chapter, we also put forward some strategies for parents and for practitioners, especially SLPs, to incorporate both languages into intervention and educational programming uh, for uh, dual language learners who also have language and communication disorders orders. So now I'm going to turn it over to Fred. Our time restraints. Um, the last chapter is on, on reading development, uh, both in typically developing readers and the readers who experience difficulties. Uh, but we felt that we needed to actually back up a little bit and talk about what reading development entails in monolinguals because a lot of the research that's been done on monolingual children actually pertains to uh, bilingual reading development and development of reading skills in bilinguals. So in this slide, I just wanted to give you a very brief uh, overview or uh, idea of the complexity of reading development. So as we up till now, we've talked about language, 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 but when it comes to reading development, there's also other factors that are include, that are really important to consider when you're trying to assess whether a student's uh, reading development is typical or not. So it includes information about language and reading, word-related skills and text-related skills, but it also involves the student's motivation, interest and resilience. In order to learn to read efficiently, people have to be motivated to do so. Um, and, and that's not always the case if you're learning to read in a second language. But also they have to have, you also have to take into account readers' background knowledge. Now, all of these are, are, are factors that are also important for monolingual reading development. So the knowledge that comes out of that research is also helpful in understanding uh, dual language learners reading development. Next slide, please. So we spend, spend some time on that, but also it's a very, very important um, backup one, please. This is too far. In order to understand uh, whether uh, a dual language learner's reading development is typical or not, you also look at, have to look at the processes that are different for dual language learners in comparison to monolinguals. And we highlight three. The fact that dual language learners have different social and cultural experiences. The fact that they know another language. And so as Joanne pointed out, you can get cross linguistic effects that are often facilitating reading development but are usually misinterpreted as an, an interfering influence. And finally, you have to consider the fact that dual language learners are, learn, are still learning the other language. All of these are important when considering what is, whether the child's development is typical or not, and they're important to consider when designing instruction and when designing support for uh, struggling readers. Next slide, please. Now, and also in this chapter, there's a quite an extensive discussion of assessment issues, which I'm not talking about uh, here now, because the assessment issues in uh, looking at reading development are, are equally complex to those that you confront when you're looking at assessment and language development. But we're, what I'm going to talk about very briefly here is at the end of the chapter, we provide some evidence-based summaries of strategies that are effective in supporting struggling readers, whether they have a reading disorder or whether it's just a difficulty. And here are some key ones. You should begin early as, as soon as possible. You should individualize support. The one size all, the one size fits all strategy doesn't work. You should make your support explicit as well as individualized. 
It should be dynamic and it should change as the student's response to intervention changes. And it should be multi-componential so that even though you're working perhaps on word-related skills, you need to work on students' motivation, their general language development, and their background knowledge. So all of this is intended to be very practical. It's intended for both um, uh, reading specialists who might be supporting uh, struggling readers, but it also can be very helpful for uh, classroom teachers who are working with uh, groups of students who are both dual language learners and, and monolinguals. So this is all evidence-based, but the main thrust of this section of the chapter is practical. How do you support these students uh, become efficient readers? Okay, thank you. I think it's back to Naya. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you both so much. We got tons and tons of questions. Um, and just to be conscious of everyone's time, I will ask um, just a couple. Um, so I'll start with this one. How best can we teach English while promoting the growth of the native language in a diverse age um, or skill classroom? Is the question how to support uh, second language learning, say in English, in a classroom where you've got multiple home languages? Is that, is that the that's, question? That's correct. Okay. Um, obviously, it's much more challenging uh, in that situation than if you've got a classroom where most of the second language or heritage language speakers speak a common other language. But even in a multilingual classroom, I think a very good starting point, and Joanne can complement this, a very good starting point is for teachers to show appreciation for other languages in the classroom, to show that speaking other languages is a great thing. It makes these kids special. And that, it, and that it's not only special that, the, that they should promote the idea that it's special that these kids speak other languages, but they should promote the idea among their majority language speakers that it's great to speak another language because it allows these learners to really see themselves represented in the classroom. I've also been in classrooms where uh, the teacher, as she's going along in her math lesson, she will call on students who speak Serbian or Chinese or Arabic to uh, talk about how you would do this in those languages, Sim simply by asking children, what are the, how do you count in Arabic or in Serbian? How would you divide it and so on? So uh, it, this can indirectly support the development of the home language by encouraging these children to not abandon it and also to send out the message that it could just be better. Yeah. I mean, I, I would um, echo everything Fred has said, and I, I think that especially here in, in Canada, um, we have more diversity in the minority first languages of children in the classrooms. There's no one predominant language like there is in the United States, and that language is Spanish. So um, I think that what is recommended here and what I've seen teachers do is um, what Fred has suggested, but um, also, you know, planning throughout, uh, you know, throughout the curriculum points where you can bring out the sort of the, the funds of knowledge um, about the language and the culture that uh, children from different backgrounds can bring to the classroom and going beyond the sort of dinner dr dance dress model where, oh, we'll have a potluck and everyone will bring food from their country or something like something a little bit um, more meaningful, um, even getting kids to write out in their own orthography if they can or get their parents to help them, the word for mother in their language. I saw um, a kindergarten class where this was done and it was this beautiful map of all these different orthographies and the word for mother. And the kindergarten teacher told me that after she had this in the hallway and then um, there were some renos in the school and a couple of workmen came to her classroom and said, you know, the word for mother in my language isn't on your board. And so they wrote it down and it got put on the board. Um, um, I've seen meaningful, really interesting thematic um, units in classrooms where, say, uh, teachers decide tea, the role of tea, because in many cultures, the tea is drunk and there's ceremonies around tea. And um, all the kids, the parents came in, they had a collection of teapots and different kinds of tea. And um, it was, it was uh, the kids were, you know, now you might think kids shouldn't be drinking tea, <laughs> but it, it brought together the different cultures in a really, really interesting way and the mainstream culture um, as well and it was it was linked into curriculum elements so it wasn't something that was that was an add-on so all of these kind of things are go under the header of an inter inter um, 
intercultural as opposed to multicultural approach. So intercultural refers to the emphasis on communicating across cultures rather than just treating everything like a, a little folklore dance here or something like that there, but um, really engaging. Yeah, that's definitely engaging and, and very inclusive. Um, and it gives children a lot of opportunities to like learn about different cultures and individuals. So that's awesome. Um, another question we got was, do you have any good resources or tools um, for your for use in the classroom to help promote interculturalism and integration over assimilation? Hmm. Well, you know, I'll start and then Joanne. There are uh, we provide additional resources uh, in the book for people to follow up on various topics. Um, I, the intercultural uh, and the cultural component of both uh, development and education in particular um, are discussed at, at some length, but not as extensively as you might find in other books. Because this is a whole other, uh, not only field of inquiry, but there's a whole other set of skills and knowledge that are important in understanding intercultural and cross-cultural issues. And there's only so much we could do already. Brooks was pulling its hair out at 150 additional pages. There's only, there was only so much we could do. But I would be interested to hear what Joanne has to say about this. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, we, we couldn't cover um, as much detail on this as perhaps would be helpful or desirable. Um, but, and I don't have anything to hand, any quick resources that might help teachers directly. Um, but I know that this is out there and Google searches might lead you to find some practical kind of tools for the classroom for interculturalism and um, translanguaging. So interculturalism, uh, translanguaging, things like that, um, you you know, could uh, find materials. And they're all over the place. School boards often have them. I know the Toronto District School Board. I know, again, that's Canada and probably most of you are in the US, but school boards have information um, ab about things like this often, at least they do in, in Canada, um, that are more sort of practical, like teachers could use them, you know, next day in, in, in their classroom. And um, unfortunately, in, in this kind of book, that, that's a level of granularity that we couldn't really reach. Thank you for another great response. Um, super helpful. And um, I'll ask one more question before we um, wrap up our presentation today. Um, someone asked, to start working on reading for bilingual children, do you suggest it should be done in both languages at the same time or one language at a time? For reading instruction, should we do it bi bilingually or monolingually? Is that, yeah. Um, well, it, 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 like so many uh, issues, it's, there's not one answer for all situations. My own preference is that if you're talking about uh, uh, bilingual education, dual language education, for majority language students, what we typically call immersion. So these are majority language, say, English speaking children in Canada, the US who are immersed in Spanish or in French or could be Hebrew for that matter. Uh, my, uh, the, my preference is to begin instruction in the second language, French, Spanish, or Hebrew, uh, because uh, there's such a strong tendency for students to gravitate towards English that if you start off with both languages or with English, you have trouble pulling the students back into the other language. So emphasizing the other language in the beginning, uh, it indicates to students right from the very beginning that this is very natural and it's very normal to do this in the other language. And then you build the foundations for literacy, not only in that language, but you build the foundations for literacy development in the other language. If you, if you try to split this in two languages, uh, some students will naturally gravitate to English if you let them, because it's easier to do it that way. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think that if you're talking about minor, uh, minoritized students, heritage language students, and you've got a dual language program, or you have the option of doing literacy development in one or more than one language, my bias, and again, the research supports this, is to emphasize development of the reading skills in the heritage language. Because first of all, students already know that language to some extent. So it allows them to acquire literacy skills in a language they already know. This is not true for all heritage language speakers. Their ability in the heritage language varies a lot. But if to the extent that they already know that language, they can develop literacy skills while they're also beginning to develop confidence in the majority language. 
but it also means that the, you're building a foundation in the heritage language which is much more likely to be stable and solid once you introduce the dominant language there's a tendency even uh, even in bilingual programs if students speak in another language that is a majoritized language there's a tendency to drift towards the majority language over time so you want to start with the language which is more vulnerable build uh, build students strengths and skills in that language initially knowing full well that those skills will transfer to english there's no evidence that kids who begin to learn to read in spanish first are slowed down in their acquisition of re english reading skills in fact if anything they acquire many english reading skills so start it depends on the learner and it depends on the context mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing to add to that. Wonderful answer. <laughs> yes, definitely a wonderful answer. Um, I think that was really helpful to the attendee who asked. Um, like I said, we did get so many questions and we thank everyone for submitting your questions and we thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, we're gonna head into the final slide. Fred and Joanne, thank you for that, those great responses. Um, definitely, like I said, super helpful. Thank you, everybody. Um, I just want to give a quick reminder that you will be prompted um, to complete a survey at the end of the presentation. Um, so we would love to know what you thought of the webinar. And again, anyone who completes the survey will be entered when a free book. Certificates of attendance are also available for all webinar viewers in the handout pane, and you also will be emailed your certificate as well. Like I said, um, just be sure to complete that short survey to be entered to win a copy of the book. They discussed it a lot today. so. Definitely go grab your copy, everyone. <laughs> I'd also like to share that we are offering a 20% off discount on our products, including Dual Language Development and Disorders, a handbook on bilingualism and second language learning, the third edition. So anyone who watches this webinar or the recording can use the code COFFEE121 at checkout to receive this discount. Next slide. And if you're looking for more professional development webinar opportunities over the coming weeks, be sure to visit book, the Brooks Publishing website for the latest additions to our Coffee Chat series. And for additional support, you can visit the link on your screen. On this page, you'll find a collection of recommended reading, downloadable resources, and professional development webinars from Brooks and other leading organizations. One last reminder for everyone watching this um, webinar, you will be able to download your certificate of attendance from the handouts pane. Um, and for those of you who are watching live, you also will be emailed in the next 24 hours. Um, and then if you are watching this as a recording, please follow the link on your screen to access your certificate of attendance. I just wanna say one more time, thank you to everyone who attended. Thank you for all your wonderful questions. We really appreciate you spending your time with us this afternoon. And again, thank you, Joanne and Fred for this great presentation. I just wanna emphasize, go grab that book, everyone. They gave a lot of great details and they, it's extremely updated um, as well. Thank you so much, Joanne and Fred. That was a great presentation. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Nye. Thank you, Nye. Yep. Have a great day. <laughs>